Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Corey Taylor. Uh, I'm the Office and Activities Coordinator for the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society. Welcome to our second virtual event. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you. Uh, we're excited to try this new uh, presentation format. We've had to go completely virtual during uh, the pandemic, which is brand something that's brand new to us. Um, but seems to be working out, seems to be a lot of fun. So we're excited to uh, be able to continue to share our local history with everybody uh, during these times. When we're able, we'll return to live programming and open houses, but for the time being, everything going forward is going to be virtual. Uh, we will continue doing our monthly open house like today. Uh, it'll be the second Sunday of every month at 1 p.m. Uh, instead of it being, you know, come in as you can. Um, it'll be about an hour or so, uh, just a presentation um, with different people, different subjects. Uh, so stay tuned on our website uh, and our social media pages. Uh, and you'll be able to see all the, that stuff. Uh, everything up there will be up to date. Um, and also we'll <clears throat> be partnering with West Bloomfield Parks and Recreation uh, to have a secondary event uh, every month. So before we start, before I hand this off to Christy, uh, we're going to hear a few words from our president, Gina Gregory, uh, before I begin today's program. Gina? Hello, everybody. Glad to see you here, although I can't see you. Glad that you are here. So I'm the president of the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society. And in case you don't know, let me tell you a little bit about the society. It's a 46-year-old nonprofit volunteer organization whose mission is to collect preserve and stimulate public interest in the history of Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, Orchard Lake, and West Bloomfield. Through our efforts, Apple Island was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2018. The society provides many benefits to the community. As you know, we host the monthly open house at the Orchard Lake Museum, now going virtual, speaker presentations, now going virtual with West Bloomfield Parks and will be held in the evening at 7 p.m. Email blast, social media communications, and YouTube videos. This event will be a YouTube video soon and we'll talk more about that later. Our other programs are on hold with COVID-19 restrictions and those are private group tours for or West Bloomfield second grade student tours to Apple Island and the museum. Research opportunities, annual public Apple Island event, our signature event highlighting our unique local history. We look forward to getting back to those someday. All of this adds value to the community and we hope you visit our website, which you already have, gwbhs.org, to learn more about our history Sign up for our e-blast so you're aware of what's coming up next and become a member. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. As everybody else would say, we're looking for members at this time to support us since our other avenue of streams for income are diminished. So our next one's coming up is the Roosevelt School 100th Anniversary Open House at 1 p.m. a month from today, Sunday, October 11th it will be an awesome revisit to Roosevelt School, 100 years old. You'll learn more about that then. Also on Wednesday, October 14th, join us for History Outdoors, Wayside Exhibits presentation at 7 p.m. through West Bloomfield Parks. These are ways, uh, markers that are along paths and along streets. You may have seen them throughout the community. You'll have an opportunity to learn a lot more about them. It's uh, a fascinating program. So see, check this all out at our website and thank you for joining us. Back to you, Corey. All right, thanks, Gina. Um, so before we begin the presentation, uh, I'd like to mention a couple of things. Uh, like I said before, uh, everybody except uh, Christy, uh, will be muted and uh, their video will be turned off. Uh, this is a recorded presentation, uh, so just keep that in mind if you accidentally unmute yourself or turn the video on. Um, but uh, we do encourage questions and comments. 
So uh, we'll be utilizing the chat in Zoom. Uh, it's on, if you guys don't have it on right now, it's on the very bottom of the Zoom screen. There'll be a little chat bubble you can click. Um, and you can send a message privately to me or to Christy or to everybody. Um, you can post your questions during the presentation as Christy's giving it. Um, and uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll uh, talk to Christy about those questions and see if she can answer those. Um, so our, our speaker, uh, our local historical society historian, uh, Christy Forehan, is going to be giving a presentation on the 50th anniversary of the West Bloomfield School District's ownership of Apple Island. Uh, so Christy, uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Corey and Gina. Um, I am sitting here today presenting from Orchard Lake Community Church, and I'm gonna turn my monitor to show you why, and that is because I have a view of Apple Island out the window, and it just seems like such an appropriate place to, to start today's program from. Uh, we're fortunate in this church that we were actually uh, originally founded by family that has a great connection to Apple Island that you're gonna hear about <clears throat> in the course of this presentation. So I am going to start with a, a kind of a documentary or a virtual tour of the island that I'm referring to as uh, Apple Island Then and Now. And then we'll take a short break. Then we'll talk a little bit about the educational values of the island. We'll take another short break. And then we will talk about how some of the special needs that the community might be able to participate in to help bring um, some services to the island. And uh, hopefully it'll be interesting and you'll, you'll learn something along the way. So if technology works for me, I'm going to share my screen and we'll start the first, uh, the tour. Uh, Corey, it says you told me I can't screen share. Give me one second, Christy. Sorry about that. That's all right. We're all learning. <laughs> all right, you should be able to now. All right, let me try now. Um, this one, I hope. Let's try this. And let's start rolling. Christy, it looks like the sound cut out on the video. Campbell Island. How's that? Good. Since the 1970s, it's been dedicated the Marjorie Ward Strong Woodland Sanctuary. But for short, we'll just refer to it as Apple Island. We will take a tour of the island today, guided by a map drawn by a young caretaker from the 1900s, Winfred Hamlin and we'll hear the words of Dr. Campbell Harvey, grandson of Colin and Caroline Campbell, the longest running owners of the island, who purchased the island in 1856 and summered there for over 60 years. Through our tour, we'll get to see what the island was like then and now. We'll begin our tour on the north shore of the island at the island dock. The stone dock was wide enough so that the horses and wagon could be driven right off onto the scow. The mainland dock was at the base of a high bank called the bluff. Up it was a carefully graded road, well concealed, connecting with the commerce road, which ran along the top of the bank. It was from this high bluff that persons who wished to come to the island stood and called. Someone was sure to hear and row over. Dock is in probably the same location as the dock 
that was used in the time of the islanders who vacationed here in the late 1800s through about 1940. These stairs are built and maintained by the West Bloomfield School District, who is the current owner of the island, being gifted it by the Ward Strong family in 1970. leave the area of high seat which back in the day was the best view from the island we start walking along the eastern shore the end of the island was much smaller and narrower and low and swampy but toward the eastern shore the ground rose to six or eight feet above lake level and afforded plenty of ground for the houses of cousin annie king uncle forrest and hc ellison of cleveland At one time, there were four cottages in this area that gave the adult children and family friends their own place to stay when they visited the island. Now, all that's left are depressions where the foundations would have been and scatterings of bricks where the chimneys fell, broken plate glass from the windows. Since the late 1990s, archeologists from Cranbrook Institute of Science St. Mary's University, Western Michigan University, and other institutions have come to the island to research what life would have been like in the native and more current vacationing days. The next part of our journey takes us along the southeastern shore trail and then up through the center of the island on a road that would have passed through cornfields and past the vegetable garden back in the Campbell's days. Coming down the center of the island, back of grandmother's by the fruit cellar, were a vegetable garden, potato patch, and a sweet cornfield. A wide road bordered on both sides with apple trees to a wide gate in the eastern fence. I used to enjoy, after being asked to, digging potatoes, picking a mess of sweet corn, choosing a couple of musk melons, even picking peas, beans, or cucumber. The island was dominated by the old homestead, originally built in the Greek Revival style in the 1850s, and then subsequently expanded by Colin and Caroline Campbell to accommodate their five children. At the apex of this triangle of roads was a very large old basswood whose blossoms in early summer made the air deliciously sweet. Ghost Walk was a path heavily planted with shrubs and vines so that it was shady and consequently darkened. It went from the gardens in front of the old homestead to high seat. the Campbell Foundation. This would have been the front porch you see in the old photographs. And behind me is what's left of the house, which is really just the foundation. We would have come in the front door here, parlor on one side, another sitting room, 
a hallway down the center and in the back of the kitchen. But as you can see, all we have now left is some rocks that indicate the foundation of the original home. And two or three very large trees <coughs> that have fallen into the foundation. And that makes it very difficult for us to continue showing this off as a historic site and uh, can't even really get around the, the, the artifacts and the foundation or the trail. So this is a big problem from a preservation standpoint. To the north, to the big garden that was shaped in a Maltese cross and a large tree, a smoke tree, it's not here anymore, but it's shown in some of the old photographs. And occasionally they would refer to the house as smoke tree inn. So if you can imagine this view to the lake being virtually open all the way uh, from this knoll where the Campbell house sat. Nature has definitely reclaimed this land. The most interesting work was the dividing and setting of the pinks which bordered all the walks. This grandma oversaw herself. Barberry bushes bordered the garden, which contained iris, poppies, and various annuals. When the work was finished, the hired man brought up a barrel of water from the lake, drawn by old Fanny, and each new plant was carefully watered. The old house was a rambling, red-roofed, clapboard-sided, one-story structure on a stone foundation. The central doorway opened into a long, low-ceilinged, wide hallway. To the right was the front parlor. In it was a large Victorian sofa, just like the one in the back parlor. Several matching chairs, all upholstered in black haircloth, the prickly, itchy stuff. A small, adequate fireplace, and a tin panty square piano, which accompanied us at our morning worship. Away down the hall, almost to its end, on the left was the entrance to the back parlor or sitting room, where Grandmother Campbell sat in all her glory, knitting and whirling the roost, with the help of Aunt Tina, daughter Caroline, and Uncle Forrest. The back side of the house, where the kitchen would have been at the end of the long hall, kitchen had bright sunny windows that looked out over the vegetable garden and the grape arbor and even cornfields beyond that. And hard to imagine today when you look at how overgrown the island is. Not far from the Campbell house is evidence of one of the several wells that were dug on the island. Though they were surrounded by the lake, the islanders dug wells for fresh drinking water. This one is lined in concrete and still shows evidence of some of the original plumbing. Today, we're spoiled by being able to turn on the tap, but in the Islanders' days, it was the chore of the children, like this photo of Caroline Campbell, the daughter, gathering water from the pump over this well. We're now gonna continue our journey headed north toward the Harvey Cottage and the stone well that predates the concrete one we just saw. In this area was an old three-trunked butternut tree, the trunks as large as a man's body. It ended in a wide gate to an opening going out the poorly marked road around the island and across the road to the path down the hill to the stone dock and boat landing. Our house was a few hundred feet north of the farmers at the eastern edge of the western woods. This is what's left of the Harvey Cottage today, really just the stones that made up the cellar foundation. Stream northwest of the fenced enclosure were the so-called Devendorf tents. Dr. Devendorf was founder of the Detroit Children's Hospital and a prominent Detroit physician. Just a few steps from the Harvey Cottage Foundation and the likely site of the Devendorf tents is evidence of an old stone well. This originally would have been dug deep down to the water line, so those in this area could pull up fresh water for drinking. 
you can see how the creeping myrtle and the maple trees are trying to reclaim this site and what a chore it is for volunteers from the Historical Society to keep these sites clear. Our journey continues looking over what was once meadows and cornfields toward the homes of the caretakers, the barns and the outbuildings that would have supported island life. We'll also take a look at the Western Woods. Dad raised a vegetable garden. My job was to ride horseback while he was cultivating with the plow. Kids hated that because you were riding all day long. Got pretty hot some days. So the caretakers would have lived here year round, uh, cutting ice and taking care of trail maintenance and fence maintenance and anything else that needed to be done in the winter time and obviously tending to the animals and helping with the farm chores, uh, collecting water for the families, that sort of thing when they were here vacationing. So let's take a closer look. As we approach the front porch, there's a chipmunk. So there is evidence that there's chipmunk, at least one chipmunk on the island. The house went both directions. If you look at the photographs when I show those, you'll see. Um, but the foundation is only on this side of the, of the house. The left of the coal chute in this corner here, mined and metal would have kept trying to keep the coal dry uh, when it was delivered and, and deposited into the basement. And then there's a couple of other openings in the foundation that might have been um, windows or some other form of access to the basement. Just a stone throw from the caretaker's house is the foundation of the generator house. Below ground level is a pit and evidence of a large tank that may have held fuel oil, though we may never know for sure. The Campbell households were never electrified. This building would have generated electricity for the caretaker's home and the Ward family house that we'll see later in our journey. The Campbells referred to as the Western Woods. It was never cleared of its big growth. And if you can tell, it's sort of undulating. And this is the area, the general area, where the islanders believe there might have been uh, Indian burial mounds because the ground is, is mounded in different places. Um, there's been some scientific digging out here and research, Dr. David Rose in particular, Concluded it's, it's not likely that these are Indian burial grounds, but to the islanders, they appreciated the, the mystique and the mystery and the, the possible presence that the native people had been here and left their mark. We really lived in an Indian cemetery. On a quiet, secluded little valley of the woods was a mound somewhat larger than the others and two smaller ones just north of it. Because of the unusual relics exhumed from it and taken to Scotland, we islanders at least believed Pontiac was buried there. Believe it or not, I do. As we exit the western woods, we find ourselves on the southern lakeshore trail. Whatever we did during the day, we tried to be in time for the four o'clock swim. The bathhouses were on the south side of the island. The stony shore precluded sunbathing. Each family had their own bathhouse. The girls' bathing garments were marvelous. It took a good swimmer to swim in one. Sometimes one of the most daring girls jumped off the end of the dock, took off her skirt and stockings, and enjoyed the swim. Once in a while on a Sunday afternoon, Uncle Forrest anchored the scow in deep water so that we could go swimming off it. Swimming evidently did not desecrate the Sabbath. Besides the buoyancy swimming in deep water gives, there was diving off the railing. Our 
Our walk now takes us up the hill toward the site of the Ward House. Willis Ward lived in the area on the mainland and owned many acres around the lake. He was close friends with the Campbell family. And when the children, Forrest and Caroline Campbell, found the burden of tending to the island to be too much, Willis stepped in and purchased the island as his own family retreat. This would have been the face facing south. You can see over there chim what appears to be chimney fragments because it's a lot of brick. Right here in front we have oh, probably the front patio. When we look down straight away, and we see what's left of the foundation, the construction bricks that have toppled over the years. More maple trees trying to reclaim the space. In this part of the house, we see a very long and narrow sort of basement with a really interesting extension back there. Oh, nobody's given us clear indication why this basement is so skinny and long. Some I've heard suggestion that maybe they kept sailboat mass somehow down here and needed that kind of long skinny storage. This is a relatively large house uh, occupied for a little over 20 years but only in the summertime and really went into disrepair uh, when Willis Ward passed away in 1943. And so here you can see the rise in the ground and all these bricks this might suggest that now we're looking at the old chimney. Lived in this area a long time. I remember being able to see the front of this house from the mainland through the trees before it became so overgrown. We'll finish our tour coming around from south to the western side of the island and head up toward an area we've referred to as the Cedars. Now we're walking along the southern shore of the island coming around to what Islanders refer to as Comfort Point or West Point. This is a really distinct feature of the island where the land drops right off out to the point. The spur which led into the lake enabled the farmers to drive right into the lake to fill the barrel with water, which he emptied into similar barrels outside our houses. These barrels used by the farmer were those in which whiskey, brandy, and alcohol were obtained from Walkerville by father. These contents were used to fill pint and quart bottles, which father sold for 25 cents and 50 cents, respectively.
So am I back on? Yes, you are. Okay. All right. I want to make sure that's great. So there we have it, a virtual tour of Apple Island. Um, hopefully that uh, you learned something new about the island and have a better appreciation for what it looks like right now. Um, our next clip is, is less shorter and it's about the educational uh, value of the island. So let me see if I can screen share that successfully. Hello, my name is Dr. Gerald Hill, superintendent of the West Bloomfield School District. Nearly 50 years ago, on October 11, 1970, students, teachers, and community members joined Superintendent Anthony Whittem, General Frederick Douglass Strong, and Governor William Milliken on the shores of Orchard Lake to mark the dedication of Apple Island as Marjorie Ward Strong Woodland Sanctuary. The proclamation of the day read as follows. This historic island is given to the West Bloomfield School District in memory of Marjorie Ward Strong, its principal owner and faithful conservator for half a century, whose last request was that it be preserved in its natural state as a permanent woodland sanctuary, that the children of this favored land of lakes and forests may, as young students, learn to cherish, understand, and guard the priceless gifts of nature. Not long after the dedication, a scientific study was made of the island's topography, soil, vegetation, and other natural aspects of the island. This study provided the basis for development of a curriculum to capitalize on the learning opportunities of, of, of the Marjorie Ward Strong Woodland Sanctuary. In the 1970s and 80s, West Bloomfield High School students and teachers received a grant funds to improve the trail system and use the island for studies of local ecology. The West Bloomfield Lobbyist Club donated funds for the purchase of two pontoon boats and the district installed the dock and stairs to climb the steep embankment. West Bloomfield Parks even organized a cross-country skiing outing across the lake to the island. In the 1990s, the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society began its partnership to provide docent-led tours for a school district second grade students then about 7,000 students and teachers and chaperones participated on the tours. We hope to resume this tradition as soon as conditions allow. In 2001, the first of several formal archaeological expeditions occurred on the island. Students and professors from Cranbrook Institute of Science, Madonna University, Western Michigan University, and others investigated native and European presence on the island. Artifacts uncovered during these studies are on display at the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society Museum, providing tangible evidence of the island's human history. We'd like to thank the Ward Strong family for their generous donation to our school district 50 years ago, and we'd like to thank the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society for their continued support and stewardship of Apple Island. Hi, my name is Amy Quinn, and I am the K-12 Math and Science Coordinator for West Bloomfield Schools. Uh, Apple Island is definitely one of my favorite places, uh, a treasure in West Bloomfield. Um, about a year ago, I visited the island with um, a science teacher from the high school, Nick Fralick. And our goal was really to see how could we engage in the island's educational resources in really like some new ways. I mean, in an area like this, you've got excellent examples of when a tree comes down, there's various levels of succession, of primary, secondary, tertiary succession, and what types of plants would grow uh, when a tree first comes down, and then after a certain time frame, how that changes, and so ultimately ends up back to where it was in the beginning, which was with these large, large trees. Lots of examples. After the visit, I was inspired to apply for a grant through the West Bloomfield Educational Foundation uh, to purchase some equipment that might facilitate the island research and uh, support some of the learning goals. When I think about things we can do on the island, the possibilities are endless. Uh, a wildlife camera to kind of watch the nature, storytelling, observing seasons, um, even our second graders, they learn about life cycles. They could release their butterflies on the island, looking into the water and land samples. What we would love to do is create an outdoor learning space where students could gather around with their teacher and just, you know, really enjoy the beauty around them. 
And you can't forget about the boat ride. Uh, for some, that is definitely the best part. So through the pandemic and the ever-present challenges of working on an island, we've put our plans on hold. However, our list is ready to revisit in the near future. Apple Island is a special place for all ages. It's a unique place, and we're so lucky in West Bloomfield to have this opportunity for our students and our community. few if not only sunny spots on the whole island in 2018 when students from Gretchko Elementary School with the um, really the initiative of uh, the Trifolis came out here um, and planted five snow apple trees. So well, as we approach that area hopefully we'll be able to get a good look at the trees as they've been here for two years now. The reason the area was sunny is a very large maple tree had died its branches had defoliated and left a giant sunspot uh, that you can actually see if you zoom into the island on Google Earth. So let's approach the apple trees. So if we look over here, the sun just went behind a cloud, but that is the area where the, you can see the large trunk of the tree that actually fell last summer. And there are five apple trees out there. Um, Everything else is growing because of the sunshine. So the apple trees are in a race to be taller than the surrounding maple trees. They have a small white white ribbon on them and I can um, sort of bushwhack over there and point one out. It measures about 10 feet tall. Um, it looks relatively healthy. I'm not really sure what a maple or an apple tree should look like this time of year. So um, that's one. There's another one right over here that's a little bit more um, obscured and it only measures about eight feet. It's a little bit, maybe it's in a little bit of a shadier spot. Here's one. This one also measures about 10 feet. That's number three. Number four right here measures about 10 feet. And behind number four, if you can see the ribbon, that's another one measures about 10 feet. So that's five apple trees. They are all seem to be relatively healthy, um, competing with the other trees for this sunshine. So we'll see who wins. All right, second graders. So this part is just for you. So in the past, we were able to take our second graders on a very unique field trip to the island. Yes, West Bloomfield School District has its very own island right in the middle of Orchard Lake. It's called Apple Island. Um, maybe you've seen it as you were maybe driving by around the area. Maybe your older brother or sister um, had visited the island. Well, this year we had to postpone the field trips, but we still want you to have a way to experience some of the history of the island. So over a hundred years ago, several families had cottages on the island. Uh, they would vacation on Apple Island all summer long just like when maybe your family would go up north. The island families would travel from their regular homes in the city of Detroit out to the island for some rest and relaxation. So the cottages had everything they needed for full-time living, including dishes, and furniture, cooking equipment. The Campbells, the family who owns the island the longest, vacationed there for over 60 years. Eventually, the Campbells sold the island to the Ward family, who had a summer home there for about 20 years. 50 years ago, the wards gave the island to our school district. No one lives on Apple Island. Well, I mean, except for the chipmunks and the raccoons, but you can still see evidence of the cottages. We know about the island families from writings and a few photographs passed down through the years. We also know about their life on Apple Island from the little broken pieces of dishware, glassware, and other household items that we found. So here's where your part comes in. You have a chance to investigate some of these artifacts and imagine the story behind the item. The Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society has prepared a set of worksheets and each of them has a feature of a real artifact found on Apple Island. 
So you can have fun with these artifacts by drawing what the item might have looked like before it was broken. Uh, write a short story imagining how the item might have been used. Who might have used it? Why would it have been discarded? Be creative. Some of the artifacts have maker's marks that indicate the company made, who that made the item. So this can be a clue to the item's purpose. Often you can research um, an item by Googling the maker's mark. To help bring your story to life, here's a list of the Campbell family members. Okay, you ready? So the father, um, his name was Colin. The mother was Caroline. Their children were John, Jesse, Forrest. He loved to sail and actually had his own cottage on the island as an adult. Jeannie and Caroline, who was nicknamed Tina. Also, Winford Hamlin was a young boy who lived several years on the island when his father was the caretaker. Wynn even attended Scotch school in the early 1900s. So with your parents' permission, we encourage you to share your completed worksheet with the community through the Historical Society's Facebook page. And we look forward to seeing your imagination at work and we want you to have fun and be creative. I'll be sharing a little more information about this with your teachers, but start thinking about some creative ideas. And I can't wait to see what you come up with. I just want to jump in here right now and thank Amy Quinn and Dr. Hill for their part up to this point. And I also would be remiss in not thanking Dan Durkin, who is the videographer for Dr. Hill and Amy Quinn's part. So thank you to those guys for um, adding to this presentation today. And so now we'll wrap up this portion of the program with uh, about five minutes on how the community can help out. Maintaining an island with historical and educational significance comes with unique challenges. First of all, there's the challenge of transportation. There is no bridge, no causeway. Everything arrives by boat. Students, teachers, researchers, maintenance equipment, supplies, they all must arrive by boat. Through the generous efforts of the West Bloomfield Optimist Club, we own two pontoon boats for island access. However, those boats were donated in the 1970s. Our transportation department does its best to keep the boats in service, but the boats are old, the engines are old, and we have no resources to properly protect the boats over the winter. Thus, I am asking the greater West Bloomfield community for your help. If you are a boat owner or know a boat owner who may be interested in donating a pontoon boat or assisting in retrofitting a donated boat or in donating funds for this purpose, please contact my office. Ideally, we would like to have a fleet of two reliable pontoons, each with a capacity of 3,000 pounds or about 15 passengers. Thank you for your help in keeping the island accessible for study, research, and maintenance. So sometimes we do need help keeping um, the woodland safe and the trails maintained. And that's the situation today. So about a year ago, just after the last of the Historical Society's public island tours, three very large trees fell into the foundation of the Campbell family home. This foundation from the 1850s is one of the premier historical sites on the island. And as it is now, the foundation is mostly obscured. The trails around the foundation are unsafe and blocked, and one of the affected trees actually leans over the site. So it's not a safe situation for our students or visitors. And normally volunteers um, from the Historical Society and with some help from West Bloomfield School District maintenance, they cut back the overgrowth. However, this project is too big and dangerous for just the home gardener. Uh, we really need some professional help and insight. The wood just needs to be cut and kind of rolled aside, not removed from the area. In fact, we'd hope to use some of it to make some nice little stools, like little stumps for an outdoor learning area. Um, but if you are in the tree service business and you like a challenge, please call Dr. Hill's office. And remember, this is an island. Um, so you and your crew and all your equipment would need to arrive by boat. 
Um, there's a little bit of a slope and there's no electricity. I know it sounds like fun, right? But thank you uh, for your consideration because we would love your help. In the 50 years since the school district became steward of the island, over 10,000 students and community members have had the unique opportunity to visit this natural sanctuary. Scientists have come to investigate the island's archaeology. Students have come on guided tours of the remains of vacationers of long ago. The curious and the mischievous have quite quietly slipped onto the island to explore, meander, and as evidence proves, to party. We remind the community to protect and preserve the island's ecology, artifacts, and ruins through responsible use and with school district permission. On the occasion of this golden anniversary, we express our thanks to the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society for their continued commitment to the island through the tours, awareness, and site maintenance. We are also grateful for the Society's efforts that added the island to the National Register of Historic Places in 2018. Our gratitude is further extended to the West Bloomfield School District Facilities Department for providing maintenance on the island and to the Transportation Department which pilots and maintains are two boats. I do not know of another school district which can claim an island as a campus. WBSD is fortunate that Marjorie Ward Strong's commitment to her Woodland Sanctuary has allowed our students and community to learn in such a special place with the support of our staff, our families, and others fascinated by Apple Island, we look forward to continuing our stewardship of the Marjorie Wood um, Woodland Sanctuary. Okay, so that's the um, completion of the formally prepared part of our program. Uh, Corey, I'll turn it back to you to see if we have questions. All right, thanks, Christine. Um, so I, I'd just like to point out to people um, that the video that Christy shared, um, the, the longer one, the, the then and now, Apple Island then and now, um, that's going to be shared on our YouTube channel. Um, links to that will be posted on our social media pages. And uh, so if you came in late or if you know somebody who couldn't make it today and wanted to uh, see the video, uh, there'll, there'll definitely be ways to, to see that. Um, I did have a couple people ask for Dr. Hill's, um, well, Dr. Hill's name and title. He's the, Gerald Hill is the uh, West Bloomfield School District Superintendent. Um, and he's uh, joining us at this program. So hi, Dr. Hill, thank you for coming. Um, and his phone number is posted in the chat, but for anybody who uh, missed it, uh, that's 248-865-6485. Uh, so if you guys wanted to contact him about anything that was mentioned, feel free. Um, Corey, Corey, let me also say his email is, is very easy. It's his name, gerald.hill at wbsd.org. All right. Um, and uh, the, uh, oh, the other question was Amy Quinn's email. Amy's also here, so hi, Amy. Um, her email is also in the chat. Uh, I posted it and uh, she also did. Uh, again, it's just amy.quinn at uh, wbsd.org. Um, so let's see, let me go back. I wrote down some of the questions. Um, so I saw somebody had asked, uh, would you consider planning a winter event that contains a hike out to the island, across the ice, and a tour around the island? Um, so that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, very cold, but a lot of fun. Um, logistically, it, it probably won't happen uh, just because the, you know, the lake does freeze over, but maybe not as, as uh, fully as we want it to uh, for safety of everybody involved. Um, and the island does get covered in snow, uh, so transporting, you know, equipment out there to clear the snow and make the trails accessible uh, is hard enough in the spring and summer. Um, so I'm not going to say no or never, but uh, probably not any time in the near future. Um, but uh, somebody did also ask about the uh, second grade field trips that happen in the spring. Uh, I think Dr. Hill mentioned it uh, and maybe Amy also did. Um, in their uh, videos. 
um, so our spring, uh, sec our second grader, the classes in the Westwood Field School District always get um, tours out to the island from the museum in the spring. And obviously like many things this year, uh, we had to cancel those. Uh, hopefully we're crossing our fingers that we can do them uh, in 2021 um, or sometime later in the summer uh, next year. So that's as, as far as we know about that. So hopefully we can you know, reschedule for next year sometime. Um, okay, let me see. Oh, somebody did, Claude had asked uh, which uh, Native American tribe first occupied the island. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit. First of all, we should be clear that no, there's no evidence that there was ever like a, uh, an ongoing community or village on the island of Native people. Uh, the research has shown that the Native artifacts that have been found out there are associated, there were no, no artifacts associated with women or children, which if there was a community that lived on the island, there would have been evidence that women and children were there as well. So the likely um, assumption and, and research proved or suggests that it was more of a, maybe a band of warriors that were associated with Pontiac and that they would have used it as a, as a temporary location. Um, there are definitely have been native artifacts found there. Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and who am I forgetting? Ottawa, we're yeah. all in this area. Um, that is not my expertise though, but there's a lot of information on the Historical Society's website that can talk a lot more about the historic, the native presence on the island. From my understanding, the, the island was used mostly for um, uh, a gathering place. Uh, so Chief Pontiac is not buried on the island, um, but he more than likely visited the island. Um, like other Native Americans in the area, uh, it was, it's a unique area a unique geological spot because there's what three different waterways that that come in and connect to it um so it was most likely used for a trading area um you know stuff like that so um, yeah well can i give a comment sure. go ahead uh the native american that we have come out to the island who was very familiar with his culture talks about that islands were sacred places so that they had value to the, the culture for, for that. Uh, and also for birthing babies. It was a safe place. And we have uh, some knowledge that uh, even when white people lived around here, Native Americans would come over. Uh, and I believe they were supposed to walk over. I'm not sure about that. But they would still come back and use the island in the spring. So. Um, so we did get a question about, uh, will current second grade classes be offered the opportunity to visit the island in years to follow? Uh, Gina, do you, do you think you could answer that? I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? Um, the, will current, so current second grade classes, um, or the, uh, second grade classes from 2020, uh, who weren't offered the opportunity to go to the island, um, will they be offered the opportunity to visit in the future? That will be a question for the school system to figure out at that point in time uh, with the restraints of the weather, docents, boats, budgets, and all of that. Uh, certainly we'll return to Apple Island tours when the time is right. Uh, so, you know, I hope everybody can come out then. Uh, we well advertise that. Uh, when you drive by the building, there's a sign there months ahead of time that say when the, uh, the, the tours will happen. At this point, they're always the second weekend in June, uh, Saturday and Sunday, and they run from 11 o'clock till 3.30. So those are great opportunities that we can uh, predict. The, how the school system will use it will be up to them and what's workable at that point. Okay. Thank you. Let uh, me also add that because of the shutdown in March, um, the normal tra uh, trail maintenance has not taken place. So I think you could see in some of that video, uh, there's, well, maybe I, I had to step over a few logs. There's a couple of trails where the side growth is really coming in and that clearance didn't happen. It normally, you know, there's an annual process to clean things up. And then of course the big trees that are over the Campbell Foundation that really makes it impossible easily to walk around that 
that foundation. So really before we can bring people back in a guided tour, that maintenance all has to take place. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say we've had a recent conversation with um, some, some folks over at Orchard Lake Country Club who have shown a, an interest in perhaps developing some sort of community stewardship with uh, the school district, the historical society uh, to support the island. And we're hoping that um, that may um, help out also in some of that trail maintenance that, that we need to take place. Yep, uh, and, and Dr. Hill uh, chimed in and said that um, he thinks that we could arrange something for the 2020 second grade classes um, to visit the island. And if in the, the future, if the 2021 classes can't uh, visit the island, uh, you know, I'm sure we can work something out um, to, to have, to give everybody the, the same opportunity. Um, so if any of you listening are interested in becoming a docent, to help lead all those extra tours, uh, contact the Historical Society because uh, we give you a lot of material, a lot of fun ways to, to teach the kids about the island and then you get to go out there. Um, so let me look through this chat just real quick. Um, I, I don't think there are any other questions. Um, so uh, let me, so let me just, uh, mention uh there were a couple questions about the uh the parks programs from way in the beginning of the of our program uh i linked to the event way at the beginning of the chat um but you can go to our website at uh, gwbhs.org uh slash events and all of our events are going to be um posted on there and including the registration links uh for the parks programs. Uh, so our next West Bloomfield Parks program is going to be this Wednesday, September 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, it's the 1877 History of Oakland County presentation with Jim Craft. He's our Oakland County, uh, he works for the Historical Commission for the county. Um, so that program is going to be co-hosted with parks and uh, it's free to attend. So you just have to register beforehand and you'll get all of the the event links. Um, and I did post a couple other links in the chat. Uh, somebody asked uh, for a link, to, uh, a link to donate to the Historical Society. Um, anything you, you're willing to give, uh, money, time, artifacts, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, grateful for all of it. Um, and uh, for information on Apple Island Tours, uh, there is a link in there as well. Um, just, uh, it's, our website slash Apple Island Tours, um, and we'll post up-to-date information on the tours uh, when and if we're going to do them next summer. Uh, we're planning on doing everything, you know, in person for the for the tours next summer, um, but we have a backup plan in case we can't. Um, so, Chris, Corey, I, I see a I see a question that came in the chat. If there's any relationship to OLCCP, oh, which yeah. is Orchard Lake Community Church, Kama Presbyterian, where I'm sitting right now. Um, it didn't come out in the video, so let me just take a minute and make that connection. Uh, Colin and Caroline Campbell, the sort of the matriarch and patriarch of the 60 years of, of primary island this vacationing, started, used to hold worship services on the island for the summer guests. Eventually they felt this should be, particularly Caroline felt there should be a permanent worship space. And a local resident, Peter Dow of Dow Ridge, if you know the, the road, Dow Ridge, who lay, owned land on the mainland, donated land to that purpose. And that's where I'm sitting right now. The original chapel, which you can see clearly from Commerce Road, has a blue door. That was, uh, the uh, cornerstone was laid in 1871, so 150 years ago. And it was only used as a summer chapel. It took actually three years to complete the chapel, to raise the funds and to get the uh, construction completed because there was a depression in the 1870s. But in 1874, they had the first worship service in that chapel. And sadly, the first funeral held in that chapel was of one of the Campbell children, Jesse Harvey, who died at a very young age. But that chapel, um, as I said, was only used in the summer for many, many years. Over the years, it's been slightly expanded, it's been lifted, there's a basement under it now, uh, but we do maintain it here at the church as um, sort of a historic representation and uh, it's definitely part of the Orchard Lake community and we've always felt a big connection between the church and the island for that reason. Um, yeah, and, and you can actually see
see the island from the church. Uh, it's right over your left shoulder. There it is. Um, yeah, so the island's right <laughs> um, and, uh, and you can actually see the island from the shore of the church. There's no public launch or anything, um, but you can see it. You know, it's off in the, in the background there. Um, so beautiful view. That's where we had our uh, National Register of Historic Places celebration last summer, um, which was, was very fitting. Uh, and all of the Campbell connections to, to the island uh, with the church and just the amazing view of the island. Um, oh, Christy, what's the address to the church? Do you know? Yeah, 5171 okay. Commerce Road. Oh. I'll beat me to it. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you, Paul. I guess, yeah, I thought that was right. Um, yeah, so uh, again, all of our, all the event information, this video will be posted um, online. So if you came in late or if you know somebody who wasn't able to see it or stay for the whole thing, um, that video will be posted to YouTube. Uh, and those links will be uh, shared on our social media pages and our website. Um, so if there aren't any more questions, last minute questions or comments, um, Christy, you're getting a lot of thank yous and great jobs, so. <laughs> it was fun. I, it was, uh, I, it's definitely the biggest video work I've ever produced. So thank you to everybody who helped me put this together. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for, for volunteering to do this. <laughs> uh, virtual <laughs> applause for you. <laughs> I'm gonna say you volunteered. <laughs> I know, I was like, did I volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and thank you um, and everybody. This concludes our second virtual event. So thanks for coming. Uh, we hope to see you again uh, either on Wednesday or next month for our Roosevelt Open House. Um, thanks again. Thank you for watching. Please support Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society efforts at gwbhs.org. Thank you.